the ozone layer. The, the depletion of the ozone, I'm not a physicist, so I don't know, I mean, here I stand, I'm going to, be, to stand corrected if I am uh, um, misinformed, but my impression is that the ozone layer depletion has been reversed as a result of concerted global action. The reason why we could do it was because it was technically feasible and economically not prohibitive to replace CFCs with other new kinds of gases in refrigerating units and so on and so forth. So th what we need in terms of turning the browning into the greening of humanity is to create the technology. We don't have the technology at the moment. If we did, then it wouldn't be a problem. And we can't rely on markets to produce it. Professor Avgules insists that I give him the floor, but he forgets two things. Number one, that I also want to take the floor. And number two, uh, in, a, uh, in answering the questions. And number two, that uh, democracy makes me uh, uh, give uh, the floor also to others before I, t I turn back to him and to his passion to take the floor anyway uh, 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 right now. I, I just want to, to add a few words because uh, from my uh, 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 law perspective, uh, I, I wanted to say a few things uh, in relation to what you said and to the idea of having an international environmental court. Uh, I would like just to remind you a few things uh, about what the state used to be when states were created and what the states are today. And uh, because uh, you, um, you should remember that uh, the state is a product of uh, the societies which is started in about the 14th, 15th century. And uh, this specific way of organizing politically a society was consolidated in the 18th, 19th century. It, we have not always had states. It is a new thing. We have always had political organizations of societies, but not states. And the state, uh, the modern state, just for uh, the, the sake of teaching students, has a, is a, has a birth uh, a time which is the French Revolution and the Napoleonic institutions. What was the issue then? The issue was to, uh, uh, the, the society was agricultural and the beginning of uh, the industrialist society, just the beginning, and in those days, uh, they, uh, they needed to create a common market in France. I, remain, I, rem, uh, I remind you that in France, which is the specific example, to go from one province to the other, you needed to pay taxes. And, uh, and the capitalism, the growing capitalism of those days needed a market, a true market. And uh, secondly, the capitalism of those days needed uh, the resources. In those days, all the resources were in the hands of the state. Uh, the, uh, the army produced even the bread give to, to give to the soldiers. They produced uh, the, uh, the, 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 the forms, the, uh, the shoes, everything. So uh, the French uh, Revolution uh, uh, took place. They created the common market, so they created the state of today, and at the same time, they unified the, the, the laws, codification of the laws. Why? Because every province had another legal system. And they sold out all the wealth of the state. I used to learn when I was uh, young that the revolution was done by, uh, by the, bourgeois, uh, the bourgeois, but the truth is that the bourgeois were created by the, by, by the French Revolution because they sold out everything. And uh, of course, they, perhaps they did well uh, because uh, a new society was born. Now, you have the same thing today in Europe. That's what we do in Europe. We create a common market because between Europe of today and uh, the French Revolution, you had the, the answers which were, were given to the necessity for growth was to make a war and take the growth of uh, somebody else or to have a, a colonialism and take all the resources from, for, uh, from somebody else for our sake. Now, this state does not exist anymore. It does not exist. And I can give you an example. You remember that uh, 
in America after a financial uh, crisis uh, about 10 years ago, uh, two senators, uh, Sarbanes and Oxley, introduced the legislation, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And uh, one of the few, of the many things which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, are in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is that uh, if you have a, a company which is, in, which is traded in America, in, uh, um, uh, in the stock market, and if there is, there are, it is suspected that uh, they are using illegal means to take, uh, uh, to, to take um, 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 uh, uh, contracts here or there, then the, the United States of America has the right to intervene no matter where those briberies took place. So that's how the famous Siemens case started. And America asked Siemens to employ an international company to make the investigation on the expenses of Siemens. And the investigation went to Germany, and from Germany came to Greece, eventually will go down to uh, uh, Southeast Asia, or I don't know uh, uh, where it is now. Uh, this, if you tell this story, to those who taught state and law in the 19th or the 20th century, it is unheard of. I give you, I'm giving you another example. Because where is the state to stop it? It does not exist. It cannot do anything. It's a story between the United States of America and Siemens. And it changes everything in Greece with a state just observing the fact. Another example, it is possible that uh, you have uh, a broadcasting company in uh, Vanuatu. Have you heard of the state Vanuatu, one of the last to join the, European, the United Nations? It is a state which uh, the half uh, 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 part of the year it is uh, full of water because the water comes up, and, uh, but uh, it is a state. It is possible that there one a broadcasting of, uh, uh, authority tells a story that in Greece there is uh, this and that and that. Not true story, but a story which is broadcasted. It only needs minutes to create uh, a political problem in Greece on the condition that it is taken by the main, uh, taken over by the main uh, uh, channels of, of the world. And uh, true or not true, this will change many things in our country, and the state will be just observer. I remember when uh, the private television started in Greece, a minister said that uh, if uh, any international broadcasters, uh, broadcaster starts sending, uh, starts broadcasting in Greece, then we're going to uh, bring, them, uh, bring them down with uh, uh, a missile. And uh, those are funny things. Now, we have to understand that we are in a period of time where the states have nothing to do with the states which we teach in the university. If the fish, for various reasons, do not prefer anymore the Greek seas, and they go out in the, in, in the, in the ocean, uh, we will have a problem. The states believe that they can stop the fish going out. I can tell you they cannot. Excuse me, I wanted to ask a question raised partly by the shipping example and the suggestion that we needed more transparency. It's very interesting listening to the panel because you suddenly learn about things that you don't ordinarily find, like how many more times it takes carbon to create a fridge in one country than another, or one continent than another. The possibility that cap is one cause of unfairness, but then the shipping people over here have to suffer. And it made me wonder, for ordinary people, people like me who know almost nothing about this, is there no simple graphical means of showing, for example, something like a carbon cycle? You know when you're small and in school you have the thing where 
you know, the fish eats this, and somebody eats the fish, and somebody else eats the fish. And you have a simple graphical picture of what happens to carbon that people can understand. And I was sort of curious, is there some way to represent in simple, fairly simple graphical form some of these claims about relative consumptions of carbon and the production of different goods in different countries that could be used both, for example, to provide actually quite useful information, but also in terms of pressure groups, because after all, if the thought is that we need to offset special interests, we need to put pressure on governments and so on, we need as consumers perhaps to boycott people who produce things with very high carbon levels when, so as not to disadvantage those who are making an effort to comply with lower ones. If we want, in other words, consumers and in a way citizens to have some power, then they also need information in a form that's fairly simple. And I was curious whether or not there was some way to put the sorts of claims you're making in simple graphic form. And can I just make one comment, which I hope is sympathetic to Emilius's worry. I, like you, have very strong objections to markets colonizing everything. But I don't think my objections to selling love or to selling kidneys turn on the idea that kidneys are an ill-defined asset and that there are somehow tangible goods creating which creates no externalities. My objections tend to be more that I don't think people should have to sell their kidneys to live, and therefore if markets and kidneys create this, this is a bad thing. So I was wondering whether perhaps one couldn't sort of support Emilius's worry a little more. Thank you. Please. I would like to make a point to Professor Varoufakis when he started his talk. He gave, as one of his particular examples, the case of malaria and was blaming on Big Pharma the fact they didn't make anti-malarial drugs because they couldn't make enough profits. This really is a gross oversimplification of the problems of the control of malaria. And there is a highly plausible case to be made which all green campaigners should always keep deeply in mind that the main cause for the failure of malaria eradication in the early 1970s was the decision to ban DDT based on a novel by Rachel Carson and by a decision by William Ruckelhaus at the EPA against most available evidence. And you don't have to believe the website I'm looking at at the moment that there have been 15 billion unnecessary cases of malaria since then and 100 million unnecessary deaths. But the figure is enormous. And I think it's well worthwhile for a meeting on greening humanity to bear in mind that some of the things that have been done in the cause of greening have been totally catastrophic and that one does actually have to look at all the consequences of what one does uh, rather than just the goodwill behind them. And having made this comment, I would like, also I'd like to ask all of you a question. I'm not an economist at all, but I have sat at the feet of some very distinguished ones, such as the late Professor James Mead, who I think would have said in this sort of financial crisis, what you want to do is to raise taxes and have large infrastructure product projects which may not be immediately economical, but which will be economical for our grandchildren in the United Kingdom, for example, building tidal barrages across the Bristol Channel on the 1st of 4th. And I can tell you why the British government doesn't do it, because no government is raising taxes which won't see a benefit till they've been out of office for 10 years. But could you tell us what one actually does about that? Remember that, uh, yeah, but I want uh, to conclude with all the questions, and I remember that uh, Professor Abuleas wanted to uh, desperately take uh, the floor once again. Not really. <laughs> Just um, uh, to complete my question, because I had left it incomplete. You're right, Yanis. I thought you demarcated properly, but on, not in legally binding terms. So... <laughs> what do I mean? Uh, theoretical or conceptual definitions are fine, but they do not build global consensus. And unless you have global consensus, you will never see all that in international treaty. So the big question is, how do make, you make this all binding in a global governance context? And uh, Nicholas Ashford offered a solution for a domestic context. An awfully difficult thing, you remove the special interests of the special interest groups. How do you do that? Go figure. And that's in a domestic, at the domestic level. Now, at the international level, Christos Pitelis offered an answer that an awful lot of people